Hello, my name is Robin Dupree, Senior Editor of Offshore Magazine. Welcome to, to today's webcast brought to you by Offshore on Frack Smarter with Hydrocarbon Tracers. Today's event will be presented by David Boussier, Traserco Business Development Manager, Reservoir, and sponsored by the company. Dave began his 29-year career in industrial tracer diagnostic applications with Tracerco in 1985. Through the course of his, of his career, Dave has experienced tracer application from all perspectives, ranging from site work as a field engineer responsible for individual project delivery through to business management responsible for strategic global business development. Dave has significant experience with tracer application in all areas of the hydrocarbon supply chain, including subsurface, top sides, downstream refining, and petrochemical, as well as gasoline distribution. Dave is a recognized tracer applications expert, and throughout the course of his, of his career, he has authored and co-authored numerous published papers for engineering associations and trade journals. Dave is currently managing the company's reservoir business in North America. Given the high volume of unconventional shell oil development in the country, his recent focus has been entered, centered upon ensuring deliverables to meet demand for Tracerco's recently patented hydrocarbon tagging technology providing empirical measurement of hydrocarbon production per stage in unconventional wells, a rapidly expanding business with over 30,000 stages tagged to date. Before we get started, I would like to say a few words about today's webcast. First, this presentation is both live and interactive. You can ask questions at any time by clicking on the Ask a Question area and typing in your question and clicking the Submit button. Also, if you are running pop-up blocking software, you will need to disable it to view this webcast. In addition, it is recommended that you close down all other applications for better performance. For your convenience, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of this live event. A reminder email message will be sent to all registrants with a link to the archive. It will, it will be accessible from the home page at offshoremag.com. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Welcome, Dave, and please begin when you're ready. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I want to thank you for joining us. All of us in the industry are facing a new challenge brought on the, by the surprising drop in oil price. This is going to force us to adopt new levels of efficiency in everything associated with delivering oil. This discussion uh, presents a new tracer technology you can add to your toolbox to improve unconventional oil production while maximizing drilling and while minimizing, we don't want to maximize them, while minimizing drilling and stimulation costs so that you can drill smarter and yield more. The presentation will cover a uh, basis of the technology and how it works. We'll discuss how it is applied in the field. We'll discuss how uh, samples are analyzed and what data is presented. And then finally, we'll get to the benefits uh, illustrated through a few case studies. Using tracers in the reservoirs is not really all that new a technology. Uh, Tracerco has been in the business for 50 years. In fact, we've been in uh, reservoir tagging for over 35 years. Historically, Tracers have been used in conventional oil, primarily in water and gas flooding, measuring inner well connectivity, uh, and, and kind of looking at reservoirs on a macro level. These tracers have typically and historically always been either water-soluble or radioactive materials. The demands of uh, unconventional oil production have required a new technology and a new way of looking at things. Fracking, in particular, is uh, putting new demands on, on the information we need to successfully stimulate and uh, get the most production from our wells. 
Wells now cost quite a bit more than they did in the old days. We're putting all our money into the uh, one apple barrel, if you will, as, as opposed to spreading it out over many wells like we did in the past. Our concerns now are focused on stimulating the geology uh, within the well. And this discussion talks about how tracer technologies can tell us the efficiency that we've had in our stimulation and drilling program. Fracking, data hungry, keys in on is, is my geology, well, what's happening there? Is my geology successfully producing? Are all my stages producing? Is my fracture interval spacing correct? And is my well spacing appropriate? In short, what we want to know was, was my stimulation program successful? Have I spent my money as wisely as I can? And am I going to get as much oil from this play as possible? To answer these questions, we had to come up with a, uh, a new uh, technology. Our technology can uh, identify the contribution of oil, gas, and water from each stage in a well and provide uh, an indication of the drainage area for an extended period of time. If you think about that, knowing, knowing what part of the well produced and how far out are your fractures and the connection, it's a pretty powerful tool. Our new tracers provide us an ability to uh, use 15 distinct tracers to tag gas phase, 33 unique tracers to uh, measure the oil phase in a well, and 42 distinct tracers to measure the water phase uh, of flow from a well. Water tracers used in unconventional are actually quite similar to the historic application. These, these this technology is based on the fact that uh, tracers can be added to water. They will stay in the water. They will not interact with oil or various uh, minerals they encounter in the ground. And when you flow the water back, you'll be able to measure deviations in concentration uh, of, of the water to, to determine where did the water come from, how long did it take to get from point A to point B. So here's our tracer. Here's a tracer in a water droplet. Uh, zero affinity for oil. So here comes an oil droplet. The oil droplet encounters the water with the tracer, which is our stimulation fluid, and the tracer stays in the stimulation fluid and non transferred to the oil. Oil tracers, and hydrocarbon tracers, and, and forgive me, when I say oil, you can substitute gas into your mindset at the same time, because gas and oil are, are very, you know, they're the same thing in my mind. So if I say oil, you can assume that it, that means gas as well. Oil and gas tracers uh, are based on, on a totally different principle. The, the key to this principle and what's made it, made it all uh, viable is the discovery and, and, and ability to take oil-soluble tracers and get them in a miscible fluid in the frac fluid. So the, the tracers are miscible in the water, but they have a partitioning coefficient that is 100,000 times more favorable to hydrocarbons. So we can get the tracer into the stimulation fluid. The stimulation fluid carries the tracer into the fracture matrix where when it encounters oil, it changes phase. And this gives us a method to tag in situ oil in the ground that never existed before. So in this illustration, the oil tracers are in the stimulation fluid. Along comes an oil droplet. 
When they encounter each other, the tracer transfers from the stimulation fluid into the oil or into the gas and is left behind in the gas. So on a theoretical level, that's how we're, that's how we're able to tag in situ oil on the grounds. But what does it take in a practical level to do it you know, on site? In short, uh, it's very simple to, to add tracers on site. The uh, equipment that is used is small and hand portable. We actually use hand portable pumps uh, to inject the oil and gas phase tracers, which are a liquid at uh, injection time. And we then we use an, a, a small electric pump to inject water phase tracers. Then when I say small, it runs off the DC volt system in our truck. These are connected to the low pressure uh, inlet side of the frack pumps. We typically would connect to two uh, frack uh, pumps so that if one of your pumps were to go offline, we could just turn a valve and continue with the injection and keep the study going. Water tracers are typically injected throughout the entire stimulation at a constant rate. The hydrocarbon, the oil and gas phase tracers, are typically added during the stimulation at a similar timing as the first third of the propent. The water injection program is designed to provide the constant tracer concentration to all the water in a stage. And the oil and gas injection program is designed to position the tracer deep in the fracture matrix, giving it the best opportunity to encounter native hydrocarbon in the ground. If you vary the tracer injection, you can actually uh, prioritize different substages to place your tracer in because the tracer will faithfully follow uh, the substage that, that it's in during the stimulation. Oil, water, and gas tracers are compatible with each other, so they can all be used together in the same stage and in the same well. And the purpose of it, we want, we want to inject, we want the injection procedures to be identical uh, for, for each stage of a well. Because at the end of, of the study, when we start collecting samples, we're going to make comparisons of how flowback came from uh, one stage versus flow back from another stage, and we want to start with it uh, from a uniform starting point. The, uh, at the injection, the, the overall goal is to tag the in situ oil and gas and the stimulation fluid of each stage with a unique tracer. Then when we get flow back materials, we can analyze those flow back materials and determine from where in, where in the well bore did the fluids come from and how much came from which section of the well bore. Samples are typically collected by uh, your sample collection crew. Uh, we would recommend that you any can find any convenient place downstream of the choke and upstream of any commingled separators so that we're only sampling the well of, of interest. We typically recommend that for the first 10 days after hydrocarbon flowback, you sample the well twice per day. And obviously water, we would begin sampling water as soon as water uh, was in, in the flowback fluid. Then after 10 days after first oil, we typically recommend that you go to a once per day sampling, and thereafter, we go to a weekly sampling. Sampling is made simple in that TracerCo uh, provides IATA certified sample kits for oil, water, and gas. So in the sample kits include everything that is necessary to collect the samples, 
and legally ship the samples to our laboratories. The sample kits are actually organized so that the first sample kit is designed to come back to Tracerco after whenever you've completed the first 10 days after oil of sampling. So that kit you send to Tracerco and continue your sampling, and our guarantee to you is that we will analyze those samples and have back to you a written report of the first 10 days of flowback by about the time that you're done uh, collecting uh, one-a-day samples. And then you send that kit, and we'll, we'll follow that up with a root report. So you get an early time preliminary report of how the well is coming online, and then you get a monthly summary, and then, then, then we look at uh, what the well is doing and, and go from there. I can't stress how easy it is to collect and uh, send samples. These are our sample instructions that, that go out with our kits. And as you can see, everything you need is included. It is complete the paperwork, you know, put the tape on that we provide, put it in the case we provide, and send it back to us via the prepaid carrier which we provide. So that, that's all pretty straightforward and simple. So what happens to the samples when we get them? The samples are analyzed for the presence of the tracer, and following that analysis, we, we, we can indicate where the flow in the well is coming from for the oil, gas, and water. There are two options here. Uh, the, we have strategically located labs around the world, and it's really quite easy to send samples to us, and, and we have an efficient system. And that, but if the need arises for instant on-site feedback, we have on-site capabilities to analyze for the tracers. So what, what's data available? What do we get? In short, the analysis of each sample provides a tracer production log identifying stage production at the time the sample was collected. The way this works is we know from empirical testing that the concentration of the hydrocarbon tracers will be identical, given identical flow from a stage. So deviations in tracer concentration represent variation in flow from the stage, with increased concentration representing increased flow and reduced concentration representing reduced flow from the stage. I'm stressing that again. Each sample collected provides a production log. So we can look at the well over time and tell how it is producing, what stages are online, and what uh, changes are occurring in the well. Takes a little while to collect all those samples. <clears throat> so, oh. My computer seems to be jumping around on me for some reason. The tracer log uh, has the daily production rates, okay, uh, and this data, when we look at it across the uh, x-axis is time, the primary y-axis is individual stage production, and each one of those uh, colors and bar graphs represents a stage, and the secondary y-axis is total production of the well during the time frame. So. What we have here is we have a, a indication of how every stage produced over time, what changes occurred, which, which stages came on strong and, and quit flowing early, which ones improved whenever you change choke. Uh, we get quite a good idea of what the well is doing. But it, it's, it is, as you can see, very dynamic and changing daily. 
The cumulative tracer production, which is the next uh, view of the, of the data, provides a mass balance of the tracer recovered from the well during the test period. Again, this graph presents each stage uh, cumulative production graphed alongside the well's cumulative production. This analysis is particularly useful in comparing the uh, overall stage production. It shows stage production trends while minimizing the daily variations observed in the tracer production log. The response slope of the uh, graphs in, in this graph, the, the excuse me, the response slopes indicate how a stage is producing at any point in time. With the steeper the slope, the more flow from a stage and a flat line representing no flow from a stage. The magnitude, how high it is compared to the other tracers, or uh, indicates historic flow from the well. So this is pretty, pretty concise to look at. In the, you can look at this graph and say, how is the stage producing right now along size? How did, how did it produce a week ago or two months ago or whatever? The stage contribution overview, which we're looking at uh, right now, is a simple to understand snapshot of how each stage performed during the entire time frame of the test. This is actually the graph that you show your investors or your senior managers. <laughs> because it's a concise view of what did the well do overall. What I'm trying to show you here is that uh, in this particular graph, we have the uh, stage contribution overview but we can also look at the flow of individual stages over time, which is the shadows in the background. And, and the shadow of each stage represents the contribution of that stage historically over time. So looking at the first one to the left here, we can see that that stage greatly increased its production compared to where it started at the end of the study. So we're, we're getting data in uh, three formats. We're looking at the stage contribution overview. We're looking at the daily stage production. And we look at that two ways. We look at it over time and how are all the stages affected and each stage individually over time, how is that single stage producing. And then we have the cumulative uh, tracer production log. When we, when, we, when we go in and stimulate a well and drill a well, what we normally do is we look at the geophysical data and decide where are we going to drill and where do we think we're going to stimulate along, along the well bore. Then we take the stimulation data and, and we, we make an analysis of did we do a good job stimulating the well and was it successful? And then finally, we take the production data that comes from the well, and we try to marry that so that we have these three pieces of data. And when we move to the next well, we improve our efficiency and drill the next well better. The tracer data is another tool in the toolbox. But what it really does is it marries your other data, and it provides a way to determine if the decisions and choices you made based upon the data you had going into the well were the right choices and, and the effective choices because it proves where does the oil come from so you can tie that back to your geophysical data. By knowing where the oil or gas comes from, we can tie that to our stimulation data and see if our stimulation uh, data agrees with where the oil is coming from. So it's a, it's a powerful tool, tool to improve the next well. What we can do is, is uh, 
illustrate the use of the technology with a couple of examples. Before I get to hard examples, I, I wanted to point out everybody I, I assume is probably familiar with the Eagle Ford uh, play. There's a Slumber J study that suggests only 64% of the clusters producing were producing in the average lateral in the Eaglesford, and that only 30 to 40% of the clusters were effectively stimulated. So they're in good, good geology, but we're not getting the stimulation done properly. If we knew which stages weren't producing, we could make some significant savings and redirect our drilling and stimulation costs. Reducing one stage per well would lower stimulation cost and environmental impact by three to six percent. If we take this concept ever further and talk about accurate well spacing, there's significant savings to be had, but determining well spacing is very difficult. You have to understand your, your fracture spacing, your fracture length, your fracture conductivity, uh, and your fracture, uh, the porosity uh, of the play itself. And every pad is different, uh, and it's difficult to determine the drainage area because every pad is different. If we drill our wells too far apart, we leave a lot of product in the ground unrecovered. That's not very, very good for the bottom line. And if we drill too close, we waste a lot of drilling efforts and cost, and that also is not good for the bottom line. If we had the knowledge to be able to reduce one in every five wells drilled right off the top, that is a 20% savings. So a few case studies and illustrating how uh, the technology has been used to, to improve operator production. This is a case study from two wells on the same pad in the Eagles Ford. Uh, the operator, operator had uh, two side-by-side -side wells. Both had similar geography. Uh, geo geophysical expectations, uh, they're side by side, and the operator wanted to compare two competing uh, stimulation technologies. So we tagged each uh, well, the stages in each well with uh, different tracers and compared them. And we can see that strategy one yielded 18,000 uh, barrels per month. We can see that strategy two yielded 26,000 barrels per month. So quite clearly, strategy uh, two is the better strategy in this play. But if you look at this data even closer, you'll notice that neither strategy worked in the geology of stage eight, nine area. So reducing the stimulation of these two stages would have uh, provided a cost reduction, a stimulation cost reduction of 20% 20 per, 20 while only costing a 4% oil production penalty. So, you know, if you're going to drill the next two wells in the same geology, don't drill, don't stimulate that area. Spend your stimulation money somewhere else more productive. This case study is, is a, a, another well. But in, in this case, what happened, uh, the operator wanted to compare two technologies in the same well, two stimulation technologies in the same well. So we, the, the first half of, of, of the substages, the first half of each stimulation was tagged using one set of tracers, and the second half of the stimulation in each uh, well was tagged using a different set of tracers. So we could, we could measure the effectiveness of each substage within the well. We can see that, that uh, substage A had little to no effect on the geology, the stimulation chosen in substage A had little to no effect on the geology 
that was present in stages six through 10. Substage B actually did much better and stimulated across uh, all of the geology in the well. If we look at the straight numbers, we can see that, that uh, substage B actually was three times more effective at stimulating the well than were substage A. I, I, you might think that the first half of the substage, the tracer was pushed further in to the fracture matrix, and the second half of, this, of the uh, tagging, the second set of, half of this stimulation, the tracer was near the well bore, and that's what represented the difference in the tracer responses. But we also sampled the wells on the adjoining pad, and whenever tracer migrated from this well, interconnectivity between wells to wells on, on uh, adjacent wells on the pad, they maintained that exact same ratio of three to one. So it's pretty clear that the uh, stimulation used in the second set of substages was much more efficient, much, much better for this geology. <clears throat> this is a case study of a uh, of a well where, where both oil phase tracers and water phase tracers were used. And if we look at this, the oil is the green. Uh, the oil stages are, are production is presented in green, and the water stage production is presented in blue. We can see that the hill of the well predominantly produced oil, and the toe of the well produced water. <laughs> Bottom line on that, for, on that uh, particular well was, had they not drilled, or had they not stimulated uh, stages nine and 10, they could have reduced the stimulation costs by 20%, re re reduced the amount of water that was flowing back to the well by 24%, and only cut uh, oil production by 2%. It's probably even, the value of this is probably even greater because this well uh, produced uh, reservoir water to a great extent, and the amount of reservoir water that uh, the well produced actually caused this well to be abandoned. So knowing which geology was preferential to oil and which geology was preferential to uh, oil or water allowed the operator to make the most out of a field that they might otherwise have had to abandon. All right, a little bit about interconnectivity between wells and using tracers to measure <clears throat> well spacing, pretty clearly if we inject tracer into one well, well A in this picture, if it migrates to well B and we, we collect a flow back of well B, we'll be able to prove drainage area connections. A little connectivity is good. We actually want a little connectivity, but if we have too much connectivity, it's very wasteful waste drilling, monies, and times. This is a case study of a three-well pad, uh, and what we're showing here is that one well has a tracer that were represented by blue, and the other is orange and a, and a light blue. And the flowback of each of these wells, when you look at it, you can see there's a massive communication between these wells. As much of the tracer from the, the blue well on the right nearly as recovered from the uh, light blue well on the left, which is, you know, hundreds of feet away. So a well-connected drainage area. In fact, in this particular study, that drainage area would have been served by just the well in the middle. So you could have had two-thirds drilling and stimulation cost reduction for 
uh, on this study. And, and you can take that to the next well next door and, and drill, spread your, spread your spacing out and save some money. This is an example of uh, inner well connectivity that we would typically want to see. This is a two well pad. The, and we can see looking at this that the uh, orange well connects slightly to the blue well and the blue well connects slightly to the orange well. We have in this study we had about oh, somewhere between two and seven percent uh, drainage area overlap and that is actually probably what we would like to see because if we see too much again we're drilling too many holes in the ground and wasting money if we don't see any connectivity of the drainage area we don't know how far the gap is in between and how much product we're leaving in the ground. Okay, this is a study from a well that was in the transition area between an oil-rich play and a gas-rich play. The oil tracer responses are in green and the gas tracer responses are in orange. And the object of this study was to allow the operator to identify which geology in his play was more likely to provide him condensate rich or oil as opposed to gas so that he could target his stimulation efforts. So clearly the geology that matched up with the, the tall green bars is what he wanted to target in future. Tracers are uh, environmentally friendly. They are uh, biodegradable by designs. The, the uh, tracer delivery system is based on a natural solvent which degrades in the, formula in the formation. This coupled with uh, tracer detection sensitivity of parts per trillion means that when we do do a study, we're adding maybe one gallon of, of tracer to 300,000 gallons worth of stage tagging. Uh, the tracers are compatible with all the frac fluids, and they're biodegradable, <laughs> biodegradable and government approved by, oh, just the whole alphabet soup of government agencies who look into these kind of things globally. And that brings me to the end of the discussion. So I, I can take questions. Yes, thank you. We have reached the question and answer portion of the webcast presentation. The first question that we have from an attendee is, what would be the longest time interval you can monitor hydraulic frac stage contribution to production? That's an, uh, that's an excellent question. And with all the difficulties I was having with the, with the slides, I actually uh, admitted discussing that, I, I, I noticed. So let me go back a few slides here if I have the capability, and I'll, I'll tell you how it works. What we're doing is we're putting in a finite amount of tracer into the I'm going to give up on these pictures. We're, we're, we're putting in a finite amount of tracer into each stage. And the study is actually over whenever all of the tracer we put into a stage is recovered. So there's not an exact time that I can say it'll be one week, one month, one year. It depends on the flow from the well. When we, when we do the cumulative uh, tracer analysis, that is a mass balance. And the mass balance we use in two ways. One is we look at how much tracer was recovered compared to how much we injected. And we use that mass balance to determine if a stage is approaching a point where we have recovered all the tracer that we had put into that stage. What we don't want to do is confuse tracer running out of a stage having no tracer left to produce with a stage not producing oil. So we look at the mass balance if a stage quits producing. We look at the mass balance to see if we're at a place where we can expect to have run out of tracer. 
But even more importantly, we look at how that stage compares with other stages and the overall production of the well. The stage that will consume all its tracers first will be the stage that is the most prolific producer in the well. If you lose your most prolific producer, one of two things has to happen. Either the production, the overall production of the well has to drop by a corresponding value or other stages within the well have to increase their production to um, make up for the loss from that stage. So we're doing, we do a mass balance of tracer recovered and then we do a mass balance across uh, stage production to, to the sum of the total production from the well. We've had to try and answer your question a little more directly. We, we typically go in and say a month, but it's, it's frequent. We have wells that we're still sampling a year later. You know, it, it's really dependent on the flow of the well. Next. Great, thank you. The next question is, what is the maximum number of stages per well you can analyze? Okay, it is 15 gas currently. It is 33 oil currently, and it is 42 water stages currently. And our research and development has uh, additions to that in the wings, but they're in, the, in, in proving stages right now. Okay. Great, thank you. The next question is, does it matter if the fluid goes through a pumping system, such as an ESP or a jet pump or rod pump? No, it, it, it won't make a difference to us. Okay, how much tracer material per segment fract is normally sent down and how long does it last? Well, another, it's another good question. The, the tracer per, per phase, is typically about one gallon per stage. So totally we would put in, in a 30 stage uh, frack, we might add 30 gallons of biodegradable solvent to the total uh, fracture. What was the first part? There was a, can you read that question again? Because there was a, a first part that I missed. Uh, yes. Oh, I know what it is. Forget it. It was how, how long does it last? The tracers themselves uh, are, are chemical compounds. They will uh, last forever. So that if, if we are performing a study, let's say we're doing a gas well, and we fill that gas well back for whatever, five days, ten days, to prove that the well is viable, and then we shut the well in for two months or two years, it doesn't matter, until we build infrastructure back to the well to get the gas out, we could then pick up the study right where we left off. And that's true for all of the tracers, for the gas, for the oil, and for the water. I was just illustrating with gas. All right, I think that got that question. Okay, is it common to find stages that are not productive? If so, what is a common percentage? You know, I probably don't disagree with that Schlumberger study. Uh, it, it is really quite common to find stages that are that are not uh, productive. I I've looked at it quite closely, and we've done hundreds of wells, probably thousands, and, and we've done tens of thousands of stages. And I I looked at even in different plays, trying to see if I could find uh, some kind of pattern that said toe stages don't produce or hill stages or mid stages or, or anything. But it is, I guess, the geology that we're going into because I could find no patterns like that. I would say it's the rare well that all the stages produce. The commonality would probably be, I would have to guess, if I'm making a, if I'm making a number up, which I am, let's say maybe 20% of them, you'd have been better off putting your stimulation somewhere else in the well. Okay. okay. Do you use tracers of different types? 
If so, how do you identify that the particular tracer is coming down a particular stage if we have commingled production from different stages, like stage one, two, or three? Oh, yeah. They are all commingled. I mean, we're, we're, we're sampling the flow back from the well at the surface. So all stage productions are going to be commingled, but we're putting in a different tracer into each stage, and that, in essence, is what we're measuring, is how much of a particular tracer is in the compound, you know, or the collection of all the tracers. And then the basis is the, the higher the concentration, since they all come back uniformly from the stage, the higher the concentration in the commingled flow, the more oil or, or gas that had to come from that stage to raise that concentration compared to the other stages. Okay. Great. Another question from an attendee is, do you have examples to show tracer response could be correlated to any other fracture diagnostics, treatment pressure response, micro seismic, et cetera? It is important to have this correlation for using the tracer response and the predictive mode for completing new wells. Absolutely. I, I, I agree 100%. And well, our normal mode of, of operation is tracer code brings an expertise in tracer applications, and we know the pitfalls and limitations of our technology. So the normal mode of operating is we generate this data. We analyze it from a tracer perspective, but then we sit with our customers and help them tie that into all of the other data that they have. So there are examples of this being tied to uh, geological expectations and to production conventional production logging, that's the norm. It, we are one tool in the tool, tool, toolkit. All right, next question. Are the oil and water tracers continuously injected throughout the whole stage treatment or injected as a slug? Okay. The, the water tracers are injected continuously throughout the entire treatment. The water tracers, every, every stage gets an individual tracer. Um, it's put in at a specific concentration. When we flow the well back, when we flow water back from the well, we then sample the water and measure deviations from the known injected concentration for each stage. And if, if we, we know what we put in, we know what to expect to come back, if all stages were producing equally. The concentration of all stages in the commingled flow of water would be identical. And by measuring the difference in concentration, then we can start to determine how much flow of water came from each uh, stage. The oil and gas phase tracers are entirely different. They, they don't work on that proposition at all. The oil and gas phase tracers, the hydrocarbon tracers, are carried into the fracture matrix by the stimulation fluid. There are immiscible micro bubbles inside the stimulation fluid. They're injected as a slug. Now, that slug is probably, again, going to be about one third of the stimulation of the proper addition to the stimulation at that time. So what we want to do is we want the stimulation to fracture the rock and make, make the fracture matrix as big as it is. We start putting in propent, and when we start putting in propent, we start putting in tracer. We, we put tracer in for about the first third of the, of the propent stimulation. The principle is these tracers are going to change phase from the stimulation fluid to the hydrocarbon phase on contact with hydrocarbon. We choose that point of the stimulation because that's when stimulation fluid is being pushed as deep into the fracture matrix as it, as it ever will be. And that gives the tracer the best opportunity to encounter hydrocarbon along the entire fracture matrix. When you flow the well back now, the water comes back out, the stimulation fluid comes back out, 
But our tracer is no longer in the stimulation fluid. It's, it's in the oil or the gas in the ground. When the oil and the gas in the ground begin to produce, they will cut, carry our tracers along with them. And again, one step further, we know from empirical testing that a given amount of oil or gas flowing back from a stage will bring a given amount of tracer with it. And the technology is based on that being the same in, of every one of these 33 compounds so that every stage behaves the same. And when we flow the product, the oil, back, it commingles. We sample that commingled flow, and by measuring the concentration of tracer from each of the dis distinct stages, we can then assign how much flow came from each stage. Okay. Great, thank you. We have, I will take one more question from the audience and then I'll hand it over to you, Dave. Do you have to know the expected production fluid from each stage before the job for the tracer's selection and job design? For the water phase tracer, you need to know that because you are tagging the stimulation fluid to a known concentration and you need to know what that concentration is and you have to have a plan going in. The, it's not necessary to know that for the uh, hydrocarbon phase tracers because the stimulation fluid is only a method to carry the fluid into the ground. It won't stay with it. So, no, it, it, you don't need to know it for hydrocarbon. Okay. Now, Dave, you have a question that you would like to ask? You know, I, I, I probably do. I'm, I'm Like everybody else, I was surprised by uh, the oil price. And if you all would, I'd be interested in getting your forward-looking views of what does the audience believe the oil price will be in six months, or how long does the audience believe it'll take back to get to, how long it will take to get back to eighty-five dollars a barrel or, or some a price like that? Just curious. Okay. okay, well, we'll wait for some answers to come in. In the meantime, um, I guess I'll go ahead and ask one more question from the audience. And that is, where do you have laboratories able to do the analysis? Uh, we, have them, we have them located around the globe, and... We have, we have multiple levels of laboratories. We have, we have fixed laboratories, uh, and in the Americas, we have a fixed laboratory in Houston. We have a fixed laboratory in Edmonton, Alberta. We have a fixed laboratory in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, we have laboratories pretty much everywhere there is oil, uh, pretty much anywhere there's one of those blue dots on the question map. But we also have portable laboratories uh, that are full laboratories that, that are in a CCAN type of arrangement, which we can take to, to any region that we need a laboratory in place. It's, it's a tracer code model to uh, have laboratories as our customers demand and, and, and to, to, to meet a quick turnover on our samples. And then there's always the on-site analysis as well. Okay. One more question from the audience. Have you ever measured the oil tracer that might come out of a well during early production where water-based frac fluid is being produced but not much oil or gas? In other words, can some of the oil tracer be flowed out of well during a cleanup? Yeah, I, 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 if, if, if the oil is coming from the fracture matrix at any percentage, we can analyze that, that oil 
for the presence of our tracer because we're looking in parts per trillion. The amount of oil that would come in that situation, we could, even in that situation with trace oil being produced, tell you which stage is producing the most oil and which stage is producing the least oil. But when you looked at it in the grand scheme of things and you started thinking about the mass balance of tracer recovered, you would be looking at a, a very insignificant volume of the oil that will be produced. But it will be there, it, it, to answer your question. Okay. And one more question. How do you separate different types of tracers from commingled production? Can you use this produced tracer again? Um, the, the, no, we can't. We don't uh, reuse the tracer. The tracers are uh, chemically distinct, and in the laboratory we use uh, gas chromatography, mass spec, and each tracer has its own characteristic signature. So when we run it through the laboratory, it doesn't matter that they're commingled. We can look at the uh, sample of fluid and determine what tracer is in there and what's the concentration of that tracer. They all uh, come out differently. We can, we can look at a sample and we look at all the tracers together at the same time. But the, the tracer that's, that's uh, when we do the mass balance, remember we're only taking a, a sample. So we're, we're collecting, you know, a hundred, well, in oil we'll collect, we need a 10 milliliter sample of oil. So if you take a 10 milliliter sample of oil and the well produced you know, a thousand barrels during the day, the amount of tracer we recovered is, is is really not worth trying to separate out and use again. Okay, well that um, answers our or that is the end of our answer question and answer sec section. On behalf of Offshore Magazine and Pella Corporation, I would like to thank today's speaker, Dave, and our sponsor, Tricerca. This presentation will be archived within 24 hours and can be accessed from Offshore Magazine's homepage at offshoremag.com. A reminder email message will be sent to registrants with a link to the archive. Thank you for joining us today, everyone. Have a great day. Yeah, and if I may get in real quick, it looks like the Kent Census, just scanning over real quick, is uh, low prices are here for maybe a year. That's that's what the group is responding. Just scanning down through the through the answers I saw. Thank you all for joining. I'm sorry I had the difficulties with the slides uh, jumping around. We'll have to figure that one out. Thank you. Thanks, Dave.